It is great to see everyone here this morning. Hope that you will stay. If you're visiting with us after our worship, we will have uh, Bible classes. Then after that, we will have a meal together and hope that uh, you will be able to stay for that. One of the great blessings about being created in the image of God is free moral agency. God has blessed us with the freedom to choose. We can say, as we have up on the board, I will. We have a will. God did not create us as robots. He did not create us as just a computer that's been programmed. We have been created with the ability to choose. To choose to do His will or choose not to do His will. Throughout the Bible, we find that there are many statements that talk about doing God's will. I will. We're going to look very briefly this morning at some of the I will statements of the Old Testament. The first one we want to look at, the first couple, are found in Isaiah chapter 12. God called Isaiah to be a prophet in the sixth chapter of Isaiah to preach to his people because of their wickedness. They had chosen to do God's, uh, to rebel against God's will. And as a result of that, uh, Isaiah was called to warn them to repent, to come back. And in Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we have the first couple of I will statements that I want to consider this morning. As Isaiah is praising God, he says in Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 1, And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Isaiah here is saying in that day, the day of redemption, the day that you will praise God. He says in Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 1, O Lord, I will praise you. I will praise you. We can choose to praise God. We can have the ability to choose to praise Him. And we know from the New Testament that we are to praise Him from the Scriptures, from His will. As John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24 tells us that God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That means from our soul that we worship God and that we do it in truth. That is in harmony with God's will. I will praise you as we have praised God this morning in song, as we will praise him in prayer as we have and will continue to do, as we will praise God in the Lord's Supper as we remember the death of his son, as we will praise God in the contribution as we are privileged to give back to God for the great blessings he has given to us. I will praise you. Uh, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19, Colossians 3 and verse 16 talks about the type of musical praise that is pleasing to God. It is singing. We sing unto God. We use the instrument that God has created us with, our voice, and we praise him. Isaiah 12 and verse 1, though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. God is angry when we violate his will. Because he knows that hurts us and cuts us off from a proper relationship with him. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 talks about sin separating us from God. 1 John 3 and verse 4 speaks of sin being a transgression of God's law or being lawlessness to violate God's will. And when that happens, we die spiritually. It hurts us. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. And he is angry that God, that his will has been violated. However, when we turn back to God, the anger is turned away and you comfort me. God is a God of comfort. He comforts us. 
He blesses us. And when we turn back to Him, we have reason to praise Him. And that is why Isaiah is saying in that day, you'll say, I will praise you. Because He is one who comforts us. Verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 12. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Number one, I will praise you. Number two, in verse two, I will trust and not be afraid. See, one of the component parts of true biblical faith is trust. Biblical faith consists of hearing God's word, believing God's word, trusting God's word, and obeying God's word. Those are the four component parts of true, saving, biblical faith. Trusting God's word. And Isaiah is saying here, I will trust and not be afraid because God is my salvation. You know, we live in a dangerous world. It's not only dangerous spiritually, it's dangerous physically. I mean, you could die at any moment, not trying to be morbid, I'm just being real. We live in a very dangerous society. We don't know when that time comes. We know that we all have an appointment with death, Hebrews 9 and verse 27, but we don't know when that appointment's going to be. But we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid because we trust in God and have no fear. We're not afraid. And he goes on to say in verse 2, that Lord is my strength, he is my song, and he has become my salvation. There's our source of strength. That's why we don't have to be afraid. That's why Isaiah said, I will trust and not be afraid. Verse 3, therefore joy will be draw, uh, therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Salvation is pictured here as a well, and it's an abundant water source there. And we will draw water from it. I will praise you, Isaiah said, and I will trust and not be afraid. I will. Psalm 18. Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3. Let's look at a few more I will statements. Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3. The psalmist said, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Does that sound familiar? We just sang that. I will. I will, the psalmist says in verse 1 of Psalm 18, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. God is the source of our strength. He is the source of our salvation. He is the source of our trust. And it says here, He is the one who deserves our love. He loved us. He loved us so much that He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. John 3, verse 16 and 17. That's God's love for us. He sent His Son to die. And therefore, we should love Him. And the psalmist is saying, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. And we demonstrate our love not only by our words, but by our actions. And actions speak louder than words. Yes, saying I love you is important, but we must demonstrate it by our life. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And in John 15 and verse 14, he says, you're my friends. If you do whatever I command you, do we not want to be a friend of Jesus? Do we not want to love him as we sing in our songs or pray in our prayers? Then do what he says. Obey his commandments. Out of sincerity, out of a love, out of a devotion, obey his will. And that will demonstrate our true love. Because as verse 2 says of Psalm 18, 
The Lord is our rock. That is a place that is solid. It is secure. It's a fortress. That's where you go for protection. My deliverer. That means the Savior, the one who delivers us out of danger. My God, he says in verse 2, is my strength. That's where we get our strength from, from God and his word. As he says, I will trust. My shield, that's protection. The horn of my salvation. Horn indicates power or authority in this language. My stronghold. And when God is our stronghold, God is our fortress. God is our rock. Nothing can harm us. Nothing can defeat us. Then in verse 3, I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. I will praise Him. He's worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. So in this psalm in verse 1, I will love you and I will praise you because God is worthy of our praise. When you look into the Bible from beginning to end, you see as you understand God, He deserves our praise and adoration because of who He is and what He has done. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, we see that in heaven there is praise and worship uh, directed towards God. Revelation 4 and verse 11 says that you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. That is why we should praise Him. That is why the psalmist is saying, I will call upon Him. He's worthy to be praised. No person, no thing, not even an angel deserves this. Only God Almighty. Then you go to chapter 5 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. You find that Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, is worthy of praise. Revelation chapter 5, verse uh, <clears throat> 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us a kingdom of priests to our God and we shall reign upon the earth. God is worthy of our praise because he's our creator and he is our redeemer. And therefore, I will call upon the Lord and we will be saved from our enemies. We have enemies around us. We have the ultimate enemy, Satan himself. And he is out to destroy us. But if we put our trust in the Lord, if we put our faith and hope in the Lord, and we go to him for protection and abide in his will, then we will be saved from our enemies. I will love you, O Lord, my strength, I will call upon the Lord. I will. Psalm 16, verse 7 and 8. Psalm 16, <clears throat> verse 7 and 8. The psalmist says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Here you see the psalmist saying, I will, <coughs> I will bless the Lord, referring to praise, adoration to God. Why? He has given me counsel. That's instruction. That comes from his word. We are to receive the counsel of God and we are to ignore ungodly uh, counsel that's contrary to his will. You find that in Psalm 1. Psalm 1, as the psalmist here introduces the book of Psalms, he tells us what to beware of. Psalm 1 
In verse 1, he says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And he goes on to talk about that person being blessed as a result of that, and that person be able, being able to stand in the judgment. We're not to listen to ungodly counsel. We're to listen to God's counsel. Listen to His will. And as we listen to His will, listen to His counsel, as Psalm 16 and verse 7 says, My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. That's during those dark periods of our life. When there's darkness all around, if our mind has been instructed in the Word of God, our heart will also instruct us, based upon the Word of God, in the night seasons, in those dark places that we have to face from time to time. And notice what, all, what else he says in verse 8. Psalm 16 and verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me. That's the priority of the child of God. Putting God always before us, putting God first in our life. As Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You'll be taken care of. You put Him first. I have set the Lord always before me, because He is at my right hand, verse 8, I shall not be moved. Steadfastness. The ability to withstand in the storms and the difficulties of life. Because God is set before you and he is number one in your life. I will bless the Lord because he has given me counsel. I will. Psalm 86 verses 11 through 13. Psalm 86 verses 11 through 13. The psalmist says, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, verse 12. O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy towards me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. We begin in verse 11 where he says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. You see, we have to be instructed in God's way. Because we're not born into this world knowing it. We have to be taught it. It says in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, Jeremiah says, I know that it is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. We do not have the intuition. We do not have the intelligence. We do not have the information in and of ourselves as to how to conduct ourselves. So God has to teach us. And he has given those instructions in the Bible. It's God's word. And as a result, the psalmist is saying to God, you teach me your word and I will live in your truth. I'll live in that truth. I will conduct my life. I will walk in that truth. John 17, 17, Jesus prayed, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So you have to be taught so you can walk. You have to be taught God's word so you're able to walk in God's way. He says, unite my heart to fear your name. Talking about fearing God and walking in the truth of God's word. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all our sins. Walking, living our life according to the truth, according to the light of God's word. Then he says in verse 12, I will praise you. I will walk in your truth. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Worship, praise, adoration is not something that is to be done half-heartedly. 
It's not something that is to be done while at the same time you're thinking about what you're going to eat after you get out of here. It's not something that you do when you're looking at your watch and wondering how long is this going to take. If we're truly worshiping God as we should, time doesn't matter. We are to glorify God with all of our heart. And as a result of that, we take the time to worship Him. Sunday morning we will assemble together. Sunday night, Wednesday night, we take the time for the things that are important to us in our life. Should not God be the very most important and His church for which His Son died? I will praise you with all of my heart. I will glorify your name forevermore. Then verse 13, 4, here's the reason why. Great is your mercy towards me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. It's referring to the realm of the dead. Here's the reason why the psalmist is saying, I'm going to glorify your name forevermore. I'm going to praise you because of God's mercy. God's mercy towards us is great. Ephesians 1 and verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. God's mercy and not giving us what we deserve because of our sins provided grace as a substitute so that we might be saved. When we fully study that and understand that to the best of our ability, we will naturally respond by saying, I will praise you. I will glorify your name forevermore. I will walk in your truth. I will. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verses 12 and 13. In Psalm 51, you have David writing as he is desiring to be restored back to God. In the context, it deals with the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. He is very penitent. He wants to come back to God. He is regretting his sin. He wants that relationship to be restored with God. And in Psalm 51, verses 12 and 13, he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. I will teach. I will teach sinners your ways. People will be converted to you. Verse 12 and 13, he says, I want to be restored. That shows that David fell away. David became unfaithful. That relationship had been severed as a result of his sinful activity with Bathsheba. Now he's wanting to be restored, and he wants the joy of that salvation to be brought back into his life. Sin brings misery. Rebellion brings about heartache. But salvation can be restored, and that will bring about joy. And he says, uphold me with your generous spirit. So he wants to be back in a proper relationship with God. And he says, when that happens, when I am restored, verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your way. We have a responsibility of teaching transgressors. If we have been restored, whether it be by our initial salvation in obedience to the gospel, or whether it's because we have fallen away and been restored as a result of coming back to the Lord as David is doing here, we have the responsibility of teaching transgressors their ways. Sinners will be converted. Each of us has that responsibility. And so he is saying here, I will teach. Once that relationship is what it should be in the Lord, I will teach transgressors your ways. The responsibility of spreading that gospel. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. 
I will teach transgressors your ways. I will. Many I will statements are found throughout the Old and the New Testament. These are just a few. This morning, we hope that you will. If you're not a child of God, that you will say, I will be baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. I will walk in the ways of the Lord. I will be a member of His church. If you come confessing Christ, repenting of your sins, we have water available. We'll immerse you into Christ so His blood can take away all your transgressions. If you have become unfaithful and you need to be restored, I hope you will have the attitude of, I will come back to the Lord. I will do His will. I will turn away from my sin and I will follow Him. As always, the choice is yours. All together we stand and we sing.